live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, Kegro in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning. How you doing, everybody? It is Tuesday, December 26th, 2017. Just trying to put together a happy Boxing Day podcast for you. We took uh, probably the first day off of broadcasting anything at all, including uh, reruns, in some years, during, uh, during the weekdays anyway. Just yesterday, it occurred to me as I was scrambling to put together a uh, Christmas Day podcast and of course today's boxing day podcast and really kind of feeling overwhelmed by the task of having to do that and uh, you know not want you know how it is I don't like to leave you without something to listen to but I was talking to Scott over the weekend or just before the weekend began and he was reminding me well you know what might listenership really be on Christmas morning aren't most people occupied either if they don't celebrate Christmas by uh, enjoying the day off or getting ready to go to the movies or sleeping in or what have you. And of course, if they are celebrating Christmas, breaking away for a live streamed broadcast of a pre-recorded podcast eh, might not be tops on their list. And so I thought maybe you might enjoy a day off too. And uh, maybe a day getting away from the politics of it all. And it occurred to me that most of the time that we spend trying to get things ready for a broadcast on travel days or holidays was really a function of our being simulcast on some of the ter- terrestrial radio stations that partner with us and, you know, their need for content daily. And uh, so I'd make sure that there was something there, even if it was a rerun for them to broadcast. And I occurred to me. Of course, that is no longer the case, and so maybe now wouldn't be a a terrible time to afford myself a day off. A day off from uh, summarizing a a pre-recorded podcast or from posting over at Daily Coast that, yes, we would be on with the show, but it would be a rerun. So I figured that was about as good a day as one could possibly opt for to take off. I hope that uh, it didn't trouble you any. And I hope that you didn't have any difficulty keeping up with the news on your own, although I suppose I should be hoping for uh, that to have been the case, so that almost anything I select for you for your listening pleasure today would be news to you. And, uh, of course, as usual, I intended to go way, way back in our archives and bring you something that we had had to put aside in the rush of crazy news that we've been occupied with for about a year now in the Trump presidency. But no, there were, of course... Developments that absolutely demanded some inclusion in a Tuesday podcast for you. So here we go. Uh, right off the bat, I know uh, I wanted to start off with this Newsweek piece, Jeff Stein's Newsweek piece uh, that uh, cropped up toward the end of the week. I guess it was Thursday, December 21st is the publication date on this one. And uh, it, things are getting to a fever pitch here in terms of convincing mainstream traditional media publications to jump right in and just say something bigger than collusion might really be going on here. And we're getting to this point uh, in the story where not only, of course, are White House officials busying themselves with the task of either convincing us that there was no collusion or that if there was collusion, it's okay because, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we're getting to the point where we're needing to explain Something that was really, I don't know, science fantasy, science fiction at some point, not, you know, I guess political science fiction, I suppose we should call it. Uh, not just that there was possible collusion or not just that it may have been at, uh, oh, you know, in response to Russian influence that perhaps some electoral outcomes were influenced or changed, but that you might be looking at a presidency that uh, not only is is under Russian influence because it feels like it owes something to the Russian government for having assisted them in being installed as the administration, but just uh, that the, the the Russians wield undue influence, not even not even necessarily because of compromat or whatever other compromising material, whatever name we might want to hang on. 
uh, whatever information we might suspect or fantasize that the Russians actually have on Donald Trump. But just because the man is otherwise devoid of any ideas of his own, and it just seems to him as though anything that anybody might suggest, if they suggested alongside sufficient praise and ego stroking, might be accepted as a good idea and therefore valid to enact as American policy. That's probably the bigger danger of all of this. So... Uh, I'm forced to confront some of this, and as, uh, today might be just as good a day to dive into that and uh, get it on the record before the year ends. So we'll begin. Last May, a top White House national security official met in Washington with senior Russian officials and handed over details of a secret operation Israel had shared with its U.S. counterparts. The meeting shocked Veteran U.S. counter spies, the American official was not arrested and he continues to work in the White House today, albeit under close scrutiny. That official, of course, was Donald Trump. The president's Oval Office meeting with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, its then ambassador to uh, Washington, Sergei Kislyak as well, which only Russian photographers were permitted to record, sparked a media brush fire that was quickly overtaken by more revelations of secret contacts between Trump associates and Kremlin agents. But the incident was not forgotten by American and Israeli security officials or by longtime foreign intelligence allies of the U.S., who now wonder if the president can be trusted to protect their most guarded secrets. This, of course, occurred to all of us when we watched the meeting go down. It's only taken until now to make it into the pages of places like Newsweek that, yeah, he might just be handing over information to them point blank. For over a year, the question of collusion has driven various investigations into what's become known as Russiagate, among some circles anyway. Special counsel Robert Mueller has been pursuing questions of whether Team Trump, which included the president's son, Donald Jr., and son-in-law, Jared Kushner, actively coordinated the Trump campaign with the Kremlin to hurt Hillary Clinton in a 2016 election. That suspicion was bad enough, but now a far more grim consensus is developing in the topmost circles of the U.S. national security establishment. The president has become a pawn of America's adversary, Russian President Vladimir Putin. It's a nightmare scenario even the writers of House of Cards would have discarded as implausible. Until now. In a December 18th interview on CNN, retired Air Force Lieutenant General James Clapper, former director of national intelligence, virtually called Trump a Putin puppet. The Russian president, Clapper noted, is a former KGB case officer or spy recruiter who knows how to handle an asset, and that's what he's doing with the president. That's the appearance to me. Pressed to clarify his asset comment, Clapper said, I'm saying this figuratively. So... Take it with a grain of salt, I suppose. Wow, tweeted former CIA Russian hand John Cipher. The rest of us tried to find other clever ways to say the same thing. Good on him for having the courage to call out Putin's behavior. Our president shouldn't have fallen for it. Veteran spy handlers have judged Trump as an easy mark for Putin, who spent years in the KGB sizing up and exploiting a target's vulnerabilities. They note how easily he falls for praise, as when Putin thanked him and the CIA for helping him thwart a bomb attack plot in St. Petersburg. POTUS is a spy handler's dream. Asha Rangappa, a former special agent in the FBI's counterintelligence division, said he responds without fail to praise and flattery and telegraphs his day-to-day -day thoughts on Twitter. Likewise, said Harry Skip Brandon, a former FBI assistant director of national security and counterterrorism. He often publicly states he goes by his instincts. If that is accurate, he may be the ultimate unwitting asset of Russia. And so on. The steady drip of revelations emerging from the multiple Trump investigations, his business deals with Russian investors, his associates, many undeclared meetings with Kremlin agents, his resistance to accepting evidence of Russian meddling in the 2016 election, and his indiscretion with Israeli intelligence draws a far darker picture. Some veteran intelligence operators think it's well past time to shift the narrative on Trump's disturbing affinity for Putin, which the president insists is innocent and good for world peace. 
Everyone continues to dance around a clear assessment of what's going on, says Glenn Carl, a former CIA national intelligence officer responsible for evaluating foreign threats. My assessment, he told Newsweek, is that Trump is actually working directly for the Russians. The Israelis can't say they weren't warned. In January 2017, a few weeks before Trump's inauguration, top U.S. intelligence officials welcomed a delegation of their Israeli counterparts to Washington. The meeting proceeded uneventfully, according to Israeli intelligence journalist Ronen Bergman, although the Americans vented their dismay over a president who had loudly disparaged their past work. Just as their meeting was wrapping up, according to Bergman, and a later report in Vanity Fair, an American spymaster solemnly announced there was one more thing. They believed that Putin had leverages of pressure over Trump. His advice? Be careful. Five months later, the Israelis came to rue what they had shared with Trump's new CIA director, former Republican Representative Mike Pompeo. They were astonished to read media reports that Trump had told the Russian foreign minister and ambassador about their top secret operation in Syria to penetrate a cell of the Islamic State militant group ISIS. U.S. intelligence experts assumed the Russians had shared the information with their allies in Iran, Israel's mortal enemy. Clapper, now writing a book about his intelligence career, told Newsweek by email that the Israelis were slash are upset about it since it proves once again we can't be trusted to keep the secrets we share with them. Some of America's closest intelligence allies were also upset by Trump's leak, a former national security official tells Newsweek, on the condition that he not be identified when discussing such sensitive issues. I hear the Brits are reluctant to share intelligence on Russian subversion, he says, not as much for security reasons as for political. They don't wish to get crosswise with Trump. Another analyst, Joseph Fitzanakis, co-editor of the Intel News blog, said relations between the UK's spy chiefs and the Trump administration are extremely tense. During the 2016 campaign, he recalled Trump riled London with an unsubstantiated claim that its version of the National Security Agency, the Government Communication Headquarters, better known as GCHQ, had eavesdropped on his communications. He refused to apologize. Lower-level U.S. and foreign intelligence officers or officials customarily find ways to deal with such high-level friction, but Trump's repeated attacks on NATO have not only frustrated Washington's closest allies, but also raised questions as to whether the president has been duped into facilitating Putin's long-range objective of undermining the European Union. Some Western European colleagues are saying that sharing has been strictly limited to counterterrorism and some maritime intelligence, Fitzanakis says, there's almost no sharing on Russia. How Trump's attacks on radical Islamic terrorism will play out in the CIA's relations with the spy services of Arab, African, and Asian nations is not known. Historically, Langley has relied on such local partners to share its insights and intelligence on militant groups, sometimes to its regret when double agents wormed their way into their ranks. Israeli officials uncharacteristically howled publicly about Trump's betrayal in May and have only recently calmed down. Still, their anger could be detected months later when a former Mossad deputy director, Ram Ben Barak, did an interview with the Cypher Brief's Kim Dozier, The rule is, if I give you information to help you, you do not give this information to another side without my permission, Ben Barak said. I am sure he will not do it again because, you know, it hurts the relationship. I'm not so sure, of course. But all signs point to Trump not caring who gets hurt if it serves his interests and vanity. Despite constant evidence of Russian interference throughout the summer of 2016, culminating in a January report by Clapper and Jay Johnson, his Department of Homeland Security counterpart, saying the Kremlin had worked to put Trump in office, the president evidently permitted his incoming national security advisor, Michael Flynn, the notorious spy, of course, to intrigue with the Russians over lifting sanctions, and apparently didn't care enough to fire him after learning Flynn had lied about it to the FBI. Flynn's later indictment and plea deal, Trump tweeted, was, quote, a shame because his actions during the transition were lawful. There was nothing to hide, unquote. All this was going on despite an explicit warning from the FBI to Trump soon after his nomination about potential espionage threats from Russia, according to NBC News. FBI agents also visited longtime Trump spokeswoman Hope Hicks. How does she do it? only days after the inauguration, saying that uh, certain named Russian agents were trying to penetrate the new administration. Hicks, who said she forwarded the warning to White House counsel Donald McGahn, has not been accused of any wrongdoing. How does she do that? 
Continually jousting with Trump over his denial that any of this amounted to collusion with the Russians is a distraction, say veteran intelligence hands. It amounts to looking for an explicit quid pro quo that may not exist. It misses, moreover, what is right under our noses, wrote Rangappa, the former FBI counterintelligence agent, along with Cypher, the one-time CIA Moscow station chief, and Alex Finley a former CIA operations officer, in a joint piece for the Just Security website. There is no question that Russia made multiple unprecedented attempts to penetrate a U.S. presidential campaign, that its approaches were not rebuffed, and that its contacts were sensitive enough that everyone to a person has concealed them. These facts might never be adjudicated inside a courtroom, they added. They may not even be illegal, but they present a clear and present national security threat that we cannot ignore. I want to follow that piece up with this from the Washington Post, a uh, piece that was actually published on Christmas Day yesterday. Adam Entis, Ellen Nakashima, and Greg Jaffe teaming up for this piece entitled Kremlin Trolls Burned Across the Internet as Washington Debated Options. Kind of an interesting follow-up piece, I think, to this last one. And uh, hopefully this makes some coherent sense when we put the two of these things together. The first email arrived in the inbox of Counterpunch, a left-leaning American news and opinion site, at 3.26 a.m., the middle of the day in Moscow. Hello, my name is Alice Donovan, and I'm a beginner freelance journalist, read the February 26, 2016 message. The FBI was tracking Donovan as part of a months-long counterintelligence operation codenamed Northern Night. Internal Bureau reports described her as a pseudonymous foot soldier in an army of Kremlin-led trolls seeking to undermine America's democratic institutions. Her first articles as a freelancer for Counterpunch and at least 10 other online publications weren't especially political. As the 2016 presidential election heated up, Donovan's message shifted. Increasingly, she seemed to be doing the Kremlin's bidding by stoking discontent toward Democratic frontrunner Hillary Clinton and touting WikiLeaks, which U.S. officials say was a tool of Russia's broad influence operation to affect the presidential race. There's no denying that emails that Julian Assange has picked up from inside the Democratic Party are real. She wrote in an August 2016 entry for a website called We Are Change. The emails have exposed Hillary Clinton in a major way, and almost no one is reporting on it. Of course, everyone was reporting on it, but that's a favorite rhetorical trick. The events surrounding the FBI's Northern Night investigation follow a pattern that repeated for years as the Russia threat was building, U.S. intelligence and law enforcement agencies saw some warning signs of Russian meddling in Europe and later in the United States, but never fully grasped the breadth of the Kremlin's ambitions. Remember here, too, we uh, heard last May about the uh, conversations that the Republican leadership was having amongst itself, realizing as they were being briefed by the Ukrainian delegations and uh, I guess by law enforcement officials at the same time, that, uh, in fact, the uh, Russians were involved in meddling in democratic elections all over Europe and that the threat was very real and that it was a very serious national security threat for our foreign policy positions across the globe. And maybe they did, maybe they didn't have any inkling that this was going to go on in the United States. But so long as it was happening to other people, they weren't particularly concerned. And if it did happen to land in the United States, why everyone would be sworn to secrecy anyway, because for some strange reason, the Republican leadership knew that this would not affect Republicans negatively in at least the 2016 elections, or else they just made a magically really good guess. I don't know. Anyway, top U.S. policymakers didn't appreciate the dangers, it says here, then scrambled to draw up options to fight back. And here we're talking about U.S. policymakers in the Obama administration. In the end, big plans died of internal disagreement, a fear of making matters worse, or a misguided belief in the resilience of American society and its democratic institutions. We did have an awful lot invested in those, didn't we? One previously unreported order, a sweeping presidential finding to combat global cyber threats, prompted U.S. spy agencies to plan a half-dozen specific operations to counter the Russian threat. 
But one year after those instructions were given, the Trump White House remains divided over whether to act, intelligence officials said. We know where that division is coming from, or at least we can speculate. This account of the United States' piecemeal response to the Russian disinformation threat is based on interviews with dozens of current and former senior U.S. officials in the White House, the Pentagon, the State Department, and U.S. and European intelligence services, as well as NATO representatives and top European diplomats. The miscalculations and bureaucratic inertia that left the United States vulnerable to Russia's interference in the 2016 presidential election trace back to decisions made at the end of the Cold War, when senior policymakers assumed Moscow would be a partner and largely pulled the United States out of information warfare. When relations soured, officials dismissed Russia as a third-rate regional power that would limit its meddling to the fledgling democracies on its periphery, those about which... I guess, the Republican leadership had been briefed, as we found out in their recorded conversations. Senior U.S. officials didn't think Russia would dare shift its focus to the United States. I thought our ground was not as fertile, said Anthony J. Blinken, President Barack Obama's Deputy Secretary of State. We believed that the truth shall set you free, that the truth would prevail. That proved a bit naive. With the 2018 elections fast approaching, the debate over how to deal with Russia continues. Many in the Trump White House, including the president, play down the effects of Russian interference and complain that the U.S. intelligence report on the 2016 election has been weaponized by Democrats seeking to undermine Trump. If it changed one electoral vote, you tell me, said a senior Trump administration official who, like others, requested anonymity to speak frankly. The Russians didn't tell Hillary Clinton not to campaign in Wisconsin. Tell me how many votes the Russians changed in Macomb County in Michigan. The president is right. The Democrats are using the report to delegitimize the presidency, which I think he's doing just fine all by himself, to be honest, but okay. Other senior officials in the White House, the intelligence community, and the Pentagon have little doubt that the Russians remain focused on meddling in U.S. politics. We should have every expectation that what we witnessed last year is not a one-shot deal, said Douglas E. Lute, the former U.S. ambassador to NATO. The Russians are on to something. They found a weakness, and they will be back in 2018 and 2020 with a more sophisticated and targeted approach. The United States and the Soviet Union engaged in an all-out information battle during the Cold War. But the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, and the Bill Clinton administration and Congress in 1999 shuttered America's preeminent global information agency. They thought it was all over and that they'd won the propaganda war, said Joseph D. Duffy, the last director of the U.S. Information Agency, which was charged with influencing foreign populations. When President Vladimir Putin came to power, Russia began searching for ways to make up for its diminished military. Officials seized on influence campaigns and cyber warfare as equalizers. Both were cheap, easy to deploy, and hard for an open and networked society such as the United States to defend against. Early warning signs of the growing Russian disinformation threat included the 2005 launch of RT, the Kremlin-funded TV network, and the 2007 cyber attacks that overwhelmed Estonia's banks, government ministries, and newspapers. I'll admit to you, it's actually, uh, this makes me think about this. I'm, I'm, uh, I'll admit that it took me an awful long time to figure out or to uh, come around to believing that RT really was part of a disinformation threat. I mean, uh, I don't know what I thought of it originally. I, even when we knew that it was uh, Russia today, I thought at that point, yeah, uh, we're still kind of in that mode where Russia isn't the same sort of threat. And it was anachronistic, as I used to think even earlier in this year, to believe that Russia was really uh, launching an entire disinformation campaign that included you know, RT, I just thought, you know, it made some sense that they um, they backed. I mean, RT to me at the time, a couple of years ago, was a home, and I guess it still is, but it originally was sort of a home for uh, broadcasters and journalists who found themselves in opposition, say, to the George W. Bush campaign or uh, the George W. Bush administration for various reasons and were considered, you know, essentially dissident voices, not that uh, we think of our dissidents in the same way as you used to in the old Soviet Union, but uh, it made some sense that the Russians would delight in highlighting that, to be sure, but I never really saw it as a disinformation network, and it was difficult for me to come to accept the idea of it being a disinformation network, even post-2016 elections. 
it came, uh, it was a long time in coming around to it. And I'm still not 100% sure that I buy it in the same way that others do. But it's certainly becoming clearer that, well, one, that there was such a disinformation campaign, and two, that they were, in some cases anyway, considerably more sophisticated in their ability to disguise it or play down the obviousness of the disinformation campaign. And I think they've done that pretty successfully with RT. And uh, I've, I've come to at least view it with a lot more skepticism these days. Anyway, so yes, let's return to the article. Uh, we said the early warning signs of the growing Russian disinformation threat included the 2005 launch of RT and the 2007 cyber attacks that overwhelmed Estonia's banks, government ministries, and newspapers. A year later, the Kremlin launched a digital blitz that temporarily shut down Georgia's broadcasters and defaced the website of its president. Closer to home for Americans, Russian government trolls in 2012 went after a U.S. ambassador for the first time on social media, inundating his Twitter account with threats. But for U.S. officials, the real wake-up call came in early 2014 when the Russians annexed Crimea and backed separatists in eastern Ukraine. An intercepted Russian military intelligence report dated February 2014 documented how Moscow created fake personas to spread disinformation on social media to buttress its broader military campaign. The classified Russian intelligence report obtained by the Washington Post offered examples of the messages the fake personas spread. Brigades of Westerners are now on their way to rob and kill us, wrote one operative posing as a Russian-speaking Ukrainian. Morals have been replaced by thirst for blood and hatred toward anything Russian. Officials in the GRU, Russia's military intelligence branch, drafted the document as part of an effort to convince Kremlin higher-ups of the campaign's effectiveness. Officials boasted of creating a fake Facebook account they used to send death threats to 14 politicians in southeastern Ukraine. Five days into the campaign, the GRU said its fake accounts were garnering 200,000 views a day. Wow, pretty amazing. We'll continue with this story uh, after this first Boxing Day break. We'll be right back. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGO in the Morning, interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of KGO in the Morning. Thousands of you are downloading the show each day, but fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air. For the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com makes it easy. You can find us there by searching KGRO X or David Waldman or KGRO in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring, monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. Welcome back to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We were wrapping up, or uh, continuing rather, with the Washington Post's latest on the Internet trolls that the Russians had burning up the web in the closing days of the campaign. And uh, a little bit of very interesting background information when we left off. We were discussing their first, uh, I guess, trial run of this campaign, or or maybe it was uh, the first planned run of this campaign, uh, and the success of which brought them to think that it might uh, find some success in the United States, their first operations in Ukraine. The Ukraine operation, the article continues, offered the Americans their first glimpse of the power of Russia's post-Cold War playbook. In March 2014, Obama paid a visit to NATO headquarters where he listened as unnerved allies warned him of the growing Russia threat. Aides wanted to give the president options to push back. In the White House Situation Room a few weeks later, they pitched him on creating several global channels in Russian, Mandarin, and other languages that would compete with RT. The proposed American versions would mix entertainment with news programming and pro-Western propaganda. The president brushed aside the idea as politically impractical. In the Situation Room that day was Richard Stengel, the Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy at the State Department, who like Obama, disliked the idea. There were all these guys in government who had never created one minute of TV content talking about creating a whole network, said Stengel, the former top editor at Time magazine. 
I remember early on telling a friend of mine in TV that people don't like government content. And he said, no, they don't like bad content and government content sucks. It's a pretty good point, really. I'd be pretty skeptical of it myself. So Stengel began looking for alternatives to counter the threat. Across Eastern Europe and Ukraine, Russian language channels mixing entertainment, news, and propaganda were spreading the Kremlin's message. Stengel wanted to help pro-Western stations on Russia's periphery steal back audiences from the Russian stations by giving them popular American television shows and movies. Shortly after Obama nixed the idea of American-funded networks, Stengel traveled to Los Angeles in the hope that a patriotic appeal to Hollywood executives might persuade them to give him some blockbusters for free. Stengel's best bet was Michael M. Linton, the then chairman of Sony Pictures, who had grown up in the Netherlands and immediately understood what Stengel was trying to do. He recalled how in the 1970s, one Dutch political party sponsored episodes of M.A.S.H. to portray America as sympathetic to the anti-war movement. A rival party bought the rights to All in the Family to send the message that U.S. cities were filled with bigots like Archie Bunker. (laughs) Not a bad play. But Sony's agreements with broadcasters in the region prevented Linton from giving away programming. Other studios also turned Stengel away. In Washington, Stengel got Voice of America to launch a round-the-clock Russian-language news broadcast and found a few million dollars, just lying around, to translate PBS documentaries on the Founding Fathers and the American Civil War into Russian for broadcast in eastern Ukraine. He had wanted programming such as Game of Thrones, but would instead have to settle for the likes of Ken Burns. We brought a tiny little Swiss Army knife to a gunfight, he said. The task of countering what the Russians were doing fell to a few underfunded bureaucrats in the State Department who journeyed to the CIA, the NSA, the Pentagon, and the FBI searching for help and finding little. U.S. intelligence and law enforcement agencies in the aftermath of 9-11 prioritized counterterrorism. They worried about the legal perils of snooping on social media and inadvertently interfering with Americans' communications. The State Department created a small team to tweet messages about Ukraine, but they were vastly outnumbered by the Russian trolls. Frustrated U.S. officials concluded that the best information on Russia's social media campaign in Ukraine wasn't coming from U.S. intelligence agencies, but from independent researchers. In April 2015, Lawrence Alexander, a 29-year-old self-taught programmer who lived with his parents in Brighton, Britain, received an unexpected Twitter message from a State Department official who reported to Stengel. Can you show what the Russians are swarming on in real time? The official, Macon Phillips, asked. Your work gave me an idea. A few months later, Phillips requested an in-person meeting. Alexander, who suffers from a genetic disorder that often leaves him chronically fatigued, wasn't able to make the two-hour trek to the U.S. Embassy in London, So Phillips took the train to Brighton, where Alexander walked him through his research, which was spurred by his alarm over Putin's intervention in Ukraine and his crackdown on gays and journalists. Phillips' idea sprang from his work on Obama's first presidential campaign, which used social media analytics to target supporters. And maybe some of you listening recognize his name from that. I certainly do. One proposal now was to identify online influencers who were active on social media spreading Kremlin messages. Phillips wanted to use analytics to target them with U.S. counterarguments. State Department lawyers, citing the Privacy Act, demanded guarantees that data on Americans using social media wouldn't inadvertently be collected as part of the effort. The thought, the heart, is in the right place. Pre-internet law restricts the collection of data related to the ways Americans exercise their First Amendment rights. The lawyers concluded that it applied to tweets, leaving some State Department's officials baffled. When you tweet, it's public, said Maura Whelan, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Digital Strategy. We weren't interested in Americans. The lawmakers' objections couldn't be overcome. The project, which Phillips worked on for more than a year, was dead. While Stengel and Phillips were struggling to make do with limited resources, the CIA, at the direction of Obama's top national security advisors, was secretly drafting proposals for covert action. Russia hawks in the administration wanted far-reaching options, 
that, they argued, would convince Putin that the price he would pay for continued meddling in the politics of neighboring democracies would be certain and great, said a former official involved in the debate. One of the covert options that officials discussed called for U.S. spy agencies to create fake websites and personas on social media to fight back against the Kremlin's trolls in Europe. Proponents wanted to spread anti-Kremlin messages drawing on U.S. intelligence about Russian military activities and government corruption. But others doubted the effectiveness of using the CIA to conduct influence operations against an adversary that operated with far fewer constraints. Or they objected to the idea of U.S. spies even doing counterpropaganda. James R. Clapper, Jr., the top spy in the Obama administration, said in an interview that he didn't think the United States should emulate the Russians. Another potential line of attack involved using cyber weapons to take down Russian-controlled websites and zap servers used to control fake Russian personas, measures some officials thought would have little long-term effect or would prompt Russian retaliation. The covert proposals, which were circulated in 2015 by David S. Cohen, then the CIA's deputy director, divided the administration and intelligence agencies and never reached the National Security Cabinet or the president for consideration. Cohen declined to comment. After top White House officials received intelligence in the summer of 2016 about Putin's effort to help Trump, the deadlocked debate over covert operations to counter the Kremlin was revived. Obama was loath to take any action that might prompt the Russians to disrupt voting, so he warned Putin to back off and then watch to see what the Russians would do. After the election, Obama's advisors moved to finalize a package of retaliatory measures. Officials briefly considered rushing out an overarching new order known as a presidential finding that for the first time since the collapse of the Soviet Union would authorize sweeping covert operations against Russia. But they opted against such a far-reaching approach. Instead, the White House decided on a targeted cyber response that would make use of an existing presidential finding designed to combat cyber threats around the world rather than from Russia specifically. As a supplement to the cyber finding, Obama signed a separate, narrower order known as a Memorandum of Notification, which gave the CIA the authority to plan operations against Russia. Senior administration and intelligence officials discussed a half-dozen specific actions, some of which required implants in Russian networks that could be triggered remotely to attack computer systems. Members of the Obama administration expected that the CIA would need a few weeks, or in some cases months, to finish planning for the proposed operations. Those actions were cooked, a former official said. They had been vetted and agreed to in concept. Obama left behind a roadmap. Trump would have to decide whether to implement it. Before Trump took office... A U.S. government delegation flew to NATO headquarters in Brussels to brief allies on what American intelligence agencies had learned about Russian tactics during the presidential election. U.S. officials are normally reluctant to share sensitive intelligence with the alliance's main decision-making body, but an exception was made in this case to help fireproof all 28 allies in case Russia targeted them next, a senior U.S. official said. The Obama administration had gone through an agonizing learning curve. The Russians, beginning in 2014, had hacked the State Department and the White House before targeting the Democratic National Committee and other political institutions. By the time U.S. officials came to grips with the threat, it was too late to act. Now they wanted to make sure NATO allies didn't repeat their mistakes. Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, gaveled the closed-door session to order and the Americans ran through their 30-minute presentation. The Europeans had for years been journeying to Washington to warn senior U.S. officials about Russian meddling in their elections. The Americans had listened politely, but didn't seem particularly alarmed by the threat, reflecting a widely held belief inside the U.S. government that its democratic institutions and society weren't nearly as vulnerable as those in Europe. That's an interesting notion all by itself. I wonder whether that's, well, I mean, certainly that's our own egocentric bias there, but I wonder whether we consider ourselves and our institutions less susceptible to it, uh, not just because they're our own and we feel that way about them because they're our own, but because uh, so many 
European democracies are parliamentary democracies, which are actually designed to amplify the voice of smaller and more diverse, uh, more diverse kinds of, of parties. And we might therefore believe that they're more susceptible to, uh, I don't know what. They might believe they're more susceptible to influence by uh, fringe elements uh, or perhaps just because we so frequently see the governments established in parliamentary democracies have to dissolve or just outright collapse because they can't hold their coalitions together. And maybe that by itself gives uh, Americans a, a bias with respect to the supposed stability of its own, of our own uh, democratic institutions, where, where in fact it may turn out that they're just ossified. Wouldn't that be the most interesting outcome of all this? To find out not that our institutions are necessarily any more stable or robust because of how we built them, but that uh, it, it convinces us from the outset of an attack of this nature against our institutions, or one that counts on our our continuing confidence, whether it was warranted or not, in the stability and robustness and, and uh, dedication to truth, justice, and the American way, as it were, in our institutions. If this can't happen to us, uh, it, it just turns out that we won't believe it when it does happen. It will sound so outlandish to us that it could have possibly have happened to our uh, our system of government, which which uh, which what which stacks the odds so much against the fringes and clings so desperately to the middle, to the detriment, you know, to our great detriment sometimes. Uh, and we wonder where does the both sides do it attitude come from, or uh, or where does the the truth must lie somewhere in the middle attitude comes from? And it, it's it's a built in part of our system. And I wonder whether parliamentary democracies in Europe are somehow less susceptible to that and can see the nuance or the imbalance or the, uh, what do we call it, the, um, the asymmetry when it occurs as between, if not two major parties and only two major parties, then at least the two major coalitions. And they, uh, there's room in a parliamentary democracy where fringe players are a normal part of the discourse to come to understand more quickly when you are comparing apples and oranges. I wonder if that, I wonder if that's something worth considering. Where did I leave off with this? The Europeans, right? Yes. Uh, yes. I, I was wondering about this too, because uh, as I was reading the previous paragraphs, I'm like, the Europeans must have been going crazy because they came to us to tell us earlier that the Russians were doing this to their elections and we sort of ignored it. And even, I guess, uh, as we were discussing earlier, when Republicans found out that it was happening, it didn't concern them. Although I'm now, now it calls into question whether or not Republicans mostly dismissed it because they simply believed it couldn't happen in the United States. Although then we were getting warned that it was happening in the United States and they just refused to believe it either because of our American egocentric bias uh, toward the, uh, the, the, the bias that causes us to believe in the inherent stability of our system or did they disbelieve it or not disbelieve it? Did they simply dismiss it because they had some inside knowledge or some reason to believe that it would only be damaging to Democrats. That is now a bigger question. So as we were saying, the Europeans had for years been journeying to Washington to warn senior U.S. officials about Russian meddling in their elections. The Americans had listened politely but didn't seem particularly alarmed by the threat, reflecting a widely held belief inside the U.S. government that its democratic institutions and society weren't nearly as vulnerable as those in Europe. For the first time since the days after 9-11, the American officials in Brussels sounded overwhelmed and humbled, said a European ambassador in the room. When the briefers finished, the Allies made clear to the Americans that little in the presentation surprised them. This is what we've been telling you for some time, the Europeans said, according to Lute, the NATO ambassador. 
This is what we live with. Welcome to our lives. After Trump took office, Russia's army of trolls began to shift their focus within the United States, according to U.S. intelligence reports. Instead of spreading messages to bolster Trump, they returned to their long-held objective of sowing discord in U.S. society and undermining American global influence. Trump's presidency and policies became a Russian disinformation target. Articles from Donovan and other Kremlin-backed personas slammed the Trump administration for, among other things, supporting, quote, terrorists and authorizing military strikes that killed children in Syria. They are all about disruption, said a former official briefed on the intelligence. They want a distracted United States that can't counter Vladimir Putin's ambitions. The dilemma facing the Trump White House was a new one. How to respond? In the weeks before Trump's inauguration, Brett Holmgren, a top intelligence official in the Obama White House, briefed Ezra Cohen-Watnick, remember that guy? His Trump administration counterpart, on the actions Obama had taken. Holmgren and Cohen-Watnick declined to comment. Once in the job, Cohen-Watnick sent out memos identifying counterintelligence threats, including Russia's, as his top priority, officials said. He convened regular meetings in the White House Situation Room, at which he pressed counterintelligence officials and other government agencies, including the CIA, to finalize plans for Russia, including those left behind by the Obama team, according to officials in attendance. By spring, National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster, Senior White House Russia Advisor Fiona Hill, and Cohen Watnick began advocating measures to counter Russian disinformation using covert influence and cyber operations, according to officials. But just as in the Obama administration, the most far-reaching ideas ran into obstacles. McMaster and Tom Bossert, Trump's Homeland Security Advisor, both laid claim to controlling the cyber portfolio and would sometimes issue conflicting instructions that left policymakers and intelligence officials confused about whose direction to follow. Obama's 11th-hour actions had cleared the way for spy agencies to conduct cyber operations to counter the Russian threat, but the CIA still had to finalize the plans, and the Trump White House wanted to review them. Bossert was more cautious than McMaster about using cyber tools offensively. His message to the national security staff, a senior White House official said, was, we have to do our homework. Everybody needs to slow down. Directing the CIA to conduct covert influence operations was a similarly fraught process. Before the agency could proceed, intelligence officials informed the White House that it would need new authorities from the president. To Trump officials, the CIA appeared to be more interested in other priorities, such as proposals to target WikiLeaks. The National Security Council and the CIA declined to comment on the covert operations. The policy debates were further complicated by the difficulty of even raising Russian meddling with a president who viewed the subject as an attack on his legitimacy. In an effort to bring Trump around, Officials presented him with evidence of Putin's duplicity and continued interference in U.S. politics. But the president's recent public statements suggest that he continues to believe that he is making progress in building a good relationship with the Russian leader. Earlier this month, Trump noted that Putin, in his end-of-year news conference, had praised Trump's stewardship of the U.S. economy. He said very nice things, Trump told reporters. And herein you can see, again, illustrated as clearly as possible, the really serious danger in all this. Even if you can frame the Russian operations in terms where it doesn't impact Trump and say, oh, you know, you can still say you won legitimately, although I have my questions. But you're if you're on his team, you can say you won your victory legitimately and on your own. And he also would like to be able to manipulate you while you're in office. You really can't fall for his his praise of you and simply do what he wants because he says nice things about you or keep an open mind toward his suggestions just because he says nice things about you. You need to approach Putin with skepticism all the time. You can do it politely, but there has to be skepticism. Putin later called Trump to praise the CIA for providing Russia with intelligence about a suspected terrorist plot in St. Petersburg. That's a great thing, Trump said after the second call with the Russian leader, and the way it's supposed to work. Of course, he's got no idea how it's supposed to work, but who knows, maybe we have it.
Even White House officials who take the Russia threat seriously fret that aggressive covert action will just provoke Putin to increase his assault on a vulnerable United States. One of the things I've learned over many, many years of looking at Russia and Putin is that he's Mr. Preemption. If he thinks that somebody else is capable of doing something to him, he gets out ahead of it, said a senior administration official. We have to be extraordinarily careful. The Kremlin has given little indication that it intends to back off its disinformation campaign inside the United States. Why would they? It's been enormously successful. More than a year after the FBI first identified Alice Donovan as a probable Russian troll, she's still pitching stories to U.S. publications. In the spring, Donovan's name appeared on articles criticizing Trump's conduct of the war in Syria and defending Russian-backed leader Bashar al-Assad. U.S.-led coalition airstrike on Assad's troops, not accidental, the headline of a May 20th piece for Counterpunch read. Her last piece for Counterpunch, headlined Civil War in Venezuela, was published October 16th. Other pieces by her byline have been published in recent months at Veterans Today, where Gordon Duff, the site's editor, said he knew nothing about Donovan. I don't edit what people do, Duff said. If it's original, I'll publish it. I don't decide what's real and not real. <laughs> That's I don't edit what people do, says the site's editor. Okay, that is an approach. At We Are Change, which has also recently published Donovan's work, Luke Rudkowski, one of the site's founders, wondered why the FBI didn't contact his publication with its suspicions. I wish we could get information from the FBI so we could understand what's really happening, he said. I wish they had been more transparent. The FBI, in keeping with its standard practice in counterintelligence investigations, has kept a close hold on information about Donovan and other suspected Russian personas peddling messages inside the United States. The Bureau does not have the authority to shut down the accounts of suspected trolls housed on U.S. social media companies' platforms. We're not the thought police, said one former senior law enforcement official. The Russians are taking advantage of seams between our policies, our laws, and our bureaucracy, said Austin Branch, a former Defense Department official who specialized in information operations. The FBI said in a statement that it has employed cyber, criminal, and counterintelligence tools to deal with the disinformation threat. The FBI takes seriously any attempts to influence U.S. systems and processes, the statement said. In late November, the Post informed Jeffrey St. Clair, Counterpunch's editor, that the FBI suspects that Donovan is a Russian government persona. St. Clair said in an interview that Donovan's submissions didn't stand out among the 75 or so pitches he receives each day. On November 30th, he sent her an email saying he wanted to discuss her work. When he got no response... St. Clair followed up with a direct message on Twitter, asking her to call him immediately. On December 5th, Donovan finally replied by email, I do not want to talk to anyone for security reasons. St. Clair tapped out a new message, begging her to provide proof, a photograph of her driver's license or passport that would show that she was the beginning freelance journalist she claimed to be in her introductory email from 2016. It shouldn't be that difficult to substantiate, he wrote. He has yet to receive a response. All right, before we jump into our next break, I thought we might be able to squeeze this little story in here. U.S. Ambassador to Netherlands apologizes after bizarre fake news exchange. Probably uh, better off just watching the exchange on video, but since we don't want to violate anyone's copyright here, we're going to give you this write-up of it from uh, Jamie Ducharme here in Time. Can you believe it? Check this out. The new ambassador, the new U.S. ambassador to the Netherlands, is apologizing after a bizarre exchange with a Dutch reporter went viral in both countries. When Pete Hoekstra, remember him? Former congressman from Holland, Michigan, was confronted with remarks that he made about there being no go zones in the Netherlands, he told journalist Wouter Zwart of the news program Newsur, we're giving it our best shot at Dutch pronunciation, he said, I didn't say that. That is actually an incorrect statement. We would call it fake news. Then Zwart played the clip of Hoekstra, a conservative Republican, from a 2015 conference saying, quote, the Islamic movement has now gotten to the point where they have put Europe in chaos. Chaos in the Netherlands, where there are cars being burned. There are politicians that are being burned. 
He added, and yes, there are no-go zones in the Netherlands. Confronted with his own words, Hoekstra then denied telling the journalist that it was fake news just moments earlier. I didn't call that fake news, Hoekstra said. I didn't use the words today. I don't think I did. Well, the entire exchange was caught on camera. The interview, part of a lengthy story on Hoekstra and his new role, went viral on both sides of the Atlantic. You can see the interview, of course, embedded here in time, and you'll see that in our roundup. On Saturday, Hoekstra tweeted, I made remarks in 2015 and regret the exchange during the Newsour interview. I'm guessing that's a sort of like news hour, perhaps, in Dutch. Please accept my apology. Well, lots of Twitter traffic about that one, of course. Hoekstra, born in the Netherlands, uh, moved with his family to Holland, Michigan when he was young. His appointment to ambassador was met with some disdain in his native country, as some of the former Republican congressman's conservative ideals, including opposition to same-sex marriage and gay rights, run contrary to what most in the highly progressive country believe. After his appointment, Dutch newspaper De Volkskrant wrote that Trump, quote, put a Dutchman in the Netherlands, but it is a Dutchman from the Netherlands of the 1950s, the Washington Post reported. Pretty good, and uh, I think they've got them pegged on that one. What an unbelievable exchange. And you should see, of course, some of the Twitter discussion of that exchange is, well, it's pretty frank and pretty much uh, on the nose there, too. Of course, saying, uh, you know, it's unbelievable what goes on here in post-truth United States of America. It's really amazing that uh, he thought he could get away with that one. I don't know. For some reason, of course, Donald Trump remains able to largely get away with that kind of nonsense. And he just steamrollers over anybody who asks questions about it, I guess. And uh, I don't know. I guess Pete Hoekstra hasn't had enough practice being post-truth just yet. But, uh, well, I don't know. Perhaps he'll get better with it over time. Anyway, we'll be back after this top of the hour break with more news and a listener submission to help us along on this Boxing Day show. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to the Kegel in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. And uh, kicking off the second hour of our Boxing Day extravaganza, I guess you could call it. Uh, and I mentioned to you that I have a user submitted, uh, or a user, listener. I'm so used to the, uh, the, the blog format, I guess, of the Daily Coast platform that I still go this way. It's Paula Appenese is back after her fantastic uh, eight part series on the GOP as domestic abusers, which is getting a lot of uh, rave reviews at the end of the year. And, uh, just did have, a request in uh, a thread somewhere on Daily Coast for uh, for the written uh, version of it and also uh, the our broadcast installments of it. It was actually quite a uh, – had to invest quite a lot of time in putting together all the links to uh, both the written product and the recorded product. And I wanted to do them a favor and say, where in this enormous two-hour-long file will you find Paula's entry? So I did do them that favor. But uh, one more. To add to this, an interesting uh, a message for and from the resistance for 2018. Hi, David. As we move towards the end of the year, I wanted to give you a message for and from the resistance for 2018. We have survived a year with the Trump crime syndicate in the White House. You've done a great job of documenting the atrocities, so I don't need to list them specifically. What I want to do is focus on the resistance and what we need to do next year. Basically, I have three major points. One, we need to continue to resist. Two, we need to communicate with Democratic leaders. Three, we need to recruit new voters to support the blue wave. So, first, we need to continue to resist. Now, the resistance has made a huge difference in the way the Trump presidency has unfolded. Given that the GOP controls all three branches, it is amazing that we have stopped anything. Still, we all know that Trump and the GOP have done enormous damage to our country and to our democratic institutions, and they are going to continue to do damage until they are forced to stop. 
So I belong to some different resistance groups, and periodically people get discouraged, feeling that all the phone calling and the marching and the petition signing and the protesting and so on are accomplishing nothing, that the GOP tanks just keep on moving forward, rolling right over top of us. And they do. And they will. We have to recognize that the GOP will continue to abuse the country until they are forced to stop. Forced to stop. So our objective has to be to survive to the midterms. We have to do everything we can do to assist in a blue wave while continuing measures aimed at slowing down Trump and Republicans during the interim. Now, I want to emphasize that resistance activities have value, even if they don't appear to be successful at stopping some specific thing. We couldn't stop the tax heist, for example, but we helped make it unpopular and we put the GOP on the defensive, and that matters. That creates narratives that we want to feed, because narratives take on lives of their own. Narratives do work for us. Narratives are like passive income. They're like interest on principle. They take less and less effort while having greater and greater impact. So what narratives do we want to feed in the next year? One, that Trump is despised. Two, that Republicans have lost all credibility on multiple fronts. Three, that impeachment is inevitable. And four, that the blue wave is coming. Anything that we can do between now and the midterms that makes Trump or Republicans miserable or defensive has value. Anything that we can do that makes them look bad matters. Anything we can do that highlights GOP hypocrisy, dishonesty, cruelty, irresponsibility, cowardice, and unfitness for office feeds the narratives we want to feed. Americans, other than Trump's brainwashed deplorable base, are getting the message. The media is getting the message. As frustrating as a good deal of media coverage remains, it has changed since Trump became president, and we want that to continue. So, with respect to hanging in there and continuing to make the phone calls and writing letters to editors and signing petitions and sending postcards and helping with special elections and participating in protests and marches, here's the way to look at those efforts. First, recognize that Individually and collectively, we only have control over things that we can actually do. For example, we each have the power to make a phone call to a congressperson's office. We can't control how that call is going to be received. So instead of thinking of your phone call as an attempt to persuade a Republican to do something that he or she doesn't want to do, or not do something that he or she wants to do, think of it as a means of conveying your displeasure. You can control that, and each call, then, is a success. And that's how we need to think about resistance actions and their results going forward. Marching, writing, protest actions, they all combine to make the very important point, which is that America rejects Trumpism. The resistance actions show that the republic is angry, and that we are not being lulled or conned, and we haven't succumbed to apathy. Resistance actions help us, the resistors, connect with each other. And each person that marches or calls or writes, etc., represents numerous other people who feel the same way, but may not have the freedom or the time or the opportunity to engage in the same way. One of the images I like is that of America as a body, and the resistance are the white blood cells working to defeat the virus of conservative Trumpism. America's immune system took a while to kick in, but since the Women's March, it's been functioning. We're still sick, but we're not dead, and each day that we survive brings us closer to the moment that the fever breaks and recovery begins. So the resistance must continue. Second point, we need to communicate with Democratic leaders. Now, what do they need to hear from us? First, they need our ongoing support. Now, frankly, I'm not exactly thrilled with our leadership's response to Trump and to the GOP excesses in general, and I was particularly unhappy about the Al Franken situation. But needs must. The way I see it, our democracy is under siege. We are literally in a battle for the survival of the American experiment, and what we have to work with is what we have to work with. Those of you who heard or read my piece about the GOP abuse syndrome understand this reference. Our leaders have spent years inside an abuse bubble. While we have seen micro-episodes here and there of leadership, for the most part, our Senate and Congressional Democrats have been acting defensively rather than offensively, and they don't appear to have any overarching plan. 
It's not that they've done a bad job, and at times they've been very solid. It's more that after some false starts early on, they united and began obstructing. It's just that they've never really pushed the envelope. They've ratcheted up their language, and they engage in more verbal aggression than previously, but there's nobody has been noticeably creative or particularly motivating. I think they're banking heavily on the midterms, believing that if they can claim one or both houses, then they will then have the tools at their disposal with which to fight. With that in mind, I think we need to be calling their offices, visiting our Congress people, emailing and writing them, offering encouragement, praise, and support as much as we can between now and next November. They are human, after all. And they are in a situation no one prepared them or any of us for. I like to think that they are doing the best that they can. And however much they either rise to our expectations or disappoint us, they are the instruments through which we have to work to save this country. I think we're all better off if our leaders feel confident, if they feel appreciated, and if they feel supportive. So when you communicate with your Democratic leaders, the first point you want to make is that you appreciate what they are doing to save America from the Trump GOP menace. But there is a second message they need to receive as well, and it is this. We will work our butts off to help elect more Democrats, but then you owe us a full court effort to clean out the Republican rot. We want an impeachment, but that's not all. We want investigations and prosecutions and penalties for infractions. We are not interested in looking forward and not back this time. We want Medicare for all or some variation. We want corrupt people removed. We want reinforcement of checks and balances throughout our institutions. We want a comprehensive effort for election protection nationwide. We need to start setting expectations now for what we hope will be a return to democratic control in 2018 and 2020. My third point, we need to recruit new voters to support the blue wave. Now, we each individually have the power to reach out to people that we know and to seek out people that we don't yet know who have not been politically active and involved and activate them. The absolute most important job in front of us all now is making the coming 2018 midterm wave as big as possible. Anything we can do on a practical level to bring new people in to vote Democrats in and Republicans out is significant. We've all heard about the election in Virginia that has come down to a single vote. We all know the ways that the GOP and the alt-right rat are going to maneuver to suppress votes. So we need the biggest margins that we can muster. Talk to your friends and neighbors and co-workers and family. Find non-aligned people and activate them. Don't waste time or energy on right-wingers. Those who can be reached are reachable precisely because they are in contact with the real world. They really don't need us to tell them what they are already seeing for themselves. Let them come to you and welcome them if they do. But the hardcore deplorables are a waste of time and energy, and there is far more value in talking to people who are ignorant but interested versus people who are brainwashed and hardened in their thinking. Find out the requirements and the restrictions related to voting where you live, and then ferret out people around you who need that information. If every Democrat in America, each one of us, recruited just one previously inactive person, bam, we get the job done. Now, having said all of this, everything is subject to change in that, with Trump, just about anything can happen. He could resign next week. He could start a war next week. Robert Mueller's report could be incendiary or a complete disappointment, and we don't know what his time frame is going to be. If Mueller's conclusions are damaging enough, Republicans may be willing to cut Trump loose, not for any admirable reasons, but because they don't need him anymore. They just got their tax heist. Personally, I hope Mueller gets the goods not just on Donald Trump, but on Pence and Priebus and Ryan and McConnell and Hatch and Nunes and Steve Bannon, and I could go on. But we don't know what's going to happen. So for now, all we can reliably plan for is the midterms. So to conclude, our priorities for the next several months are clear. Keep resisting. Feed the narratives that America rejects conservative Trumpism, that Republicans have lost all credibility, that impeachment is inevitable, and that the blue wave is coming. Support Democratic leaders and communicate expectations for major cleanup work when they regain control. 
recruit new voters, and encourage sometime voters to ensure big wins in the midterms. If we follow through in those ways, we will survive as a democracy, and from there can begin moving in a positive direction again, hopefully wiser. I'm going to close with the phrase that I saw on a Facebook meme and I thought was great. I'm wishing you, David, and Greg, Armando, and Joan, and all of your listeners a merry resistance in a happy blue year. This is Paula at PaulaWriter.com. Thanks, Paula. Good advice for the best possible start, anyway, to uh, what we hope is less than another year of the Trump crazy. Now... Here's a story on a front that we opened up a long time ago here on the show, and you had to know this story was eventually going to surface. There had to be a purpose to this one. And look, maybe they're telling the truth. Maybe it's not related. Maybe it's just coincidence. It's just, well, it's just too unlikely to really be coincidence. So we're going to pick up on this one. Trump administration to grant mining leases that will benefit landlord of president's daughter, Ivanka Trump. Do you remember that she had rented her house for her family in D.C. from a Chilean billionaire who had an interest in mining. Ah, interesting, right? And there was no clear linkage to anything at the moment, but guess what? All of a sudden, about a year later, the guy who gave them a sweetheart deal on a rental house also is going to now make a bazillion more dollars in getting mining leases from the federal government. And where is it going to happen? It'll be up in Minnesota. Let me tell you the story here. James Grimaldi and Mark Merrimont put this one together for the Wall Street Journal, which I thankfully am able to read despite their usual firewall. The Trump administration said Friday it will renew mining leases to extract copper and nickel adjacent to a Minnesota wilderness area, reversing, of course, an Obama administration decision to give a uh, giving a victory to a Chilean billionaire who happens to be renting a mansion to the family of the president's elder daughter. Hmm, how interesting. Of course, this actually caught my eye because this is taking place, as we said, up in uh, the Minnesota wilderness. And it later on uh, goes on to, well, you know, I'll get to the story. We'll bring it up in a second. The, The Democratic administration of former President Barack Obama in its waning days blocked a plan by a company controlled by the family of Andronico Luxic. Hmm. That's not, doesn't strike me as a typically Chilean name, but you you never know. L-U-K-S-I-C. We'll check that out. To build a giant copper and nickel mine adjacent to a Minnesota wilderness area, citing environmental concerns. Metal mining like that, generally speaking, not particularly good for the neighboring uh, water table, as you may know. In a 19-page opinion made public Friday ahead of the Christmas holiday weekend, Daniel Giorgiani, J-O-R-J-A-N-I, a principal deputy solicitor of the Department of the Interior, said Mr. Obama's administration acted, quote, improperly in not renewing, not renewing, hmm, two key leases for the mine adjacent to the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, a 1.1 million acre tract of lakes and forest first protected by the government in 1926. The Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, of course, familiar to me because uh, my son went on the Boy Scouts of America Northern Tier High Adventure Camp trek through the area. Yes, it's a uh, it's an area that a lot of Boy Scouts, uh, they work very hard and save lots of money to try and get up there. They aspire to make it to the Northern Tier High Adventure Camp and uh, have a have a great time out there canoeing out on the water for a week, paddling in and out of Canada and the United States and uh, camping out along the way. Fantastic wilderness area. I have no idea why President Trump didn't bring that idea up when he spoke to the Boy Scout Jamboree some months ago, but uh, perhaps he'll upset Rex Tillerson with this decision. But, you know, not like he was going to display any real spine anytime soon anyway. But in addition to it all, of course, Maybe uh, Ivanka gets a good deal on buying the place, if that's what she'd prefer to do. Mr. Trump's elder daughter, Ivanka, and her husband, Jared Kushner, in case you didn't know who uh, she was married to, both top White House advisors, are paying $15,000 a month to rent their six-bedroom home in the nation's capital from Mr. Luksic, the Chilean billionaire, bought the house just after the November 2016 election for $5.5 million dollars. 
The opinion reversing the Obama move was signed by Mr. Giorgiani, a Trump appointee who previously worked for groups connected to the billionaire brothers Charles G. and David H. Koch, owners of a conglomerate that sells coal, gas, and other products, in case you didn't know who they were. In the legal opinion dated Friday, Mr. Giorgiani said renewal of the leases was a non-discretionary right. So I wonder whether uh, Mr. Luksic did, in fact, know exactly what he was doing. Uh, what would he be doing? I mean, he certainly got every right, I guess, to just buy a mansion in Washington, D.C., where apparently he doesn't live, just after the November 2016 election for five and a half million dollars, knowing, I guess, that Ivanka Trump would likely be house hunting in Washington, D.C., and maybe because he's a billionaire and her father claims to be a billionaire, they could uh, uh, meet up somewhere in the in the rather small market for five and a half million dollar mansions in Washington, D.C., and uh, cut a deal that might help him later on. Who knows? I don't know how crafty he really is. The Interior Department media office didn't respond to requests for comment. Twin Metals, Minnesota, which is running the mining project for the Luxic family's mining company, Antofagasta PLC, said it was pleased by the decision, which it called an important first step to ensure the certainty of investments in U.S. mining projects and to reaffirm long-standing property rights and the rule of law. There's an awful lot riding on these leases, eh? In federal court in Minnesota, the company moved late Friday afternoon to dismiss its lawsuit against the Interior Department that had been challenging the Obama administration and blocking this mine. A White House official said Friday that Mr. Kushner and Ms. Trump, quote, were not aware of the situation, had nothing to do with it, and have never met their landlord. Well, I'll be darned. A White House spokeswoman said in March that the family was paying fair market value for the home. The pair weren't aware of Mr. Luksic's U.S. business interests at the time that they agreed to rent the house, she has said. One year ago, just weeks before the end of the Obama administration, the Interior Department denied the mining leases, citing the risk of serious and irreparable harm to this unique, iconic, and irreplaceable wilderness area. Friday's decision was hailed by some state politicians who backed the mine as a boon for local jobs and criticized by environmental groups. It's refreshing to have an administration that understands the importance of mining to Minnesota and the entire United States, said Kirk Doubt, D-A-U-D-T, a Republican who serves as Minnesota House Speaker in a statement. It sounds like he, he does it by accident. Every once in a while I serve as House Speaker. He's, he's the Speaker of the House. Okay, you could just say that. Minnesota Governor Mark Dayton, a Democrat, called the move a shameful reversal that shows that big corporate money and special interest influence now rule again in Republican-controlled Washington. Scott Beauchamp, a spokesman for the Save the Boundary Waters environmental group, called the decision a big fat Christmas gift for a giant foreign mining corporation willing to do anything to exploit the watershed of Minnesota's crown jewel wilderness. After the Wall Street Journal published an article in March about the Kushners renting his home, Mr. Luksic tweeted in Spanish that the story was, quote, lamentable, or lamentable, I suppose, because the house and the mine were two completely independent subjects. He also tweeted, I do not know President Trump or any member of his family. Four or five years ago, I greeted him at the Patriots Stadium in Boston, the area of the disputed leases contains one of the largest untapped copper and nickel resources in the world, Twin Metals said in a court filing, conservatively estimated at more than $40 billion of in-ground mineral value. Twin Metals proposed a $2.8 million, oh, sorry, billion dollar underground mine and other facilities. The mine is to process about 20,000 tons of mineralized ore per day and employ 650 miners. The company has said it is proposing to mine for 100 years or longer on mineral leases involving 32,000 acres of federal and state lands on the perimeter of the National Forest, according to its website and a spokesman. More than $400 million has been invested in exploration and project development to date. Based on current plans, the company plans to spend more than $1.2 billion in design and construction. So we'll have to see whether anybody follows up on whether or not $15,000 a month is, quote, fair market value for a six-bedroom mansion in Georgetown, essentially. I, I have my doubts about that. 
Uh, let's see. When I li- I mean, I don't really know the D.C. real estate market all that well. When I lived in D.C., in a, uh, we rented a place that really was probably otherwise beyond our means. A very nice, uh, recently renovated townhome with, well, they called it five bedrooms. But one of the bedrooms was this tiny, practically a broom closet, but five bedroom house in, and it was a row house in the Adams Morgan area. And this was in 1990, and we got a steal and got it for five thousand dollars a month. So a six-bedroom Georgetown mansion, 20-something years later at $15,000 a month. I have my doubts about whether or not that's really fair market value, but maybe I overestimate things. Uh, more interesting and probably more to the point will be if anybody bothers to take up the question of whether or not these families really do have no connections and really haven't met previously. Uh, and again, I don't know what uh, Luke Six situation is. I suppose if he finds himself at a Patriots game, despite the fact that he's Chilean, uh, if he's got significant interests in United States uh, mining, even if it's in Minnesota, eh, you know, he's going to be he's going to want to be in Washington once in a while, probably to lobby to keep his interests, uh, you know, well tended. Uh, and maybe he's a Chilean citizen who spends most of his time outside of Chile. I don't know. I don't know where he's living these days, but. Very interesting and uh, just one of 10,000 things that are probably horribly wrong and horribly corrupt with Ivanka, Jared Kushner. I mean, Jared Kushner's off the charts corrupt so far. So just one more, one more uh, log to the fire in that respect. Coming up on our third and final break for today's show, just want to sneak in one more story that I think we ought to keep an eye on. This one from Jennifer Bendry in the Huffington Post. Back on the 19th, but I wanted to uh, enter it into the record here. Tim Kaine asked for details on sexual harassment claims in the Senate. He was denied. Subtitle here, Congress's Workplace Misconduct Office won't share data with the senator because of concerns with inaccuracies. Why don't you just make your list accurate and then you would have less concern about it. How about this first story? The Congressional Office of Compliance on Monday denied a request by Senator Tim Kaine of course, a Democrat of Virginia, for details on taxpayer-funded settlements paid out on behalf of senators or staff members accused of sexual harassment. Susan Sui Grundman, executive director of the office that responds to workplace misconduct complaints in Congress, told Kane there may be inaccurate or incomplete records regarding the number of claims filed or why cases resulted in settlement, so she did not want to provide any of it. The OOC does not possess reliable information (laughs) regarding the number of sexual harassment claims that have been filed or settled, the identities or positions of the individuals alleged to have committed sexual harassment, or why the parties reached settlements, Grundman said. There's a copy of the letter embedded in her piece here. Kane wrote to the office on December 6th asking how many harassment claims had been filed in the last decade. The number filed against members of the Senate or their staffs that ended in, quote, some form of resolution, unquote, and the amount of each settlement paid with taxpayer funds. Kane had planned to make the information public, as it should be. If Congress truly wants to fix a broken system, we need to understand the scope of the problem, Kane said in a Monday night statement. I'm disappointed the OOC didn't release any information to help us do that. I'm going to keep pushing for public release of this data and working on reforms that help prevent harassment and assault. Grundman's decision to deny Kane's request is strange, given that earlier this month her office provided the House Administration Committee with details on taxpayer-funded settlements paid out in the House one day after the committee made its request. That data showed the House had paid out six settlements since 2013, including an $84,000 sexual harassment claim against Representative Blake Farenthold of Texas. He reportedly told a female aide, oh, God, they're going to make me say it first thing in the morning here. He reportedly told a female aide she could, quote, show her nipples whenever she wanted to. And really, uh, I guess she can. It's really up to her, but you're not supposed to say that. That's the big problem. And he said he had sexual fantasies, and my goodness gracious, Blake, what are you doing to me? It's right here in the newspapers, folks. He said he had sexual fantasies and wet dreams about another female aide. Why? 
Would you say that about anybody or under any circumstances anywhere? I mean, I didn't even want to say it, and I'm talking about Blake Farenthold. Although it's probably t- two reasons why I don't want to say that, but okay. Wow, it's hard to think of anybody about whom I'd rather read that sentence less than Blake Farenthold, but wow. Okay, at any rate, listen, he's still in Congress for whatever reason, and uh, Kane's push for transparency comes amid a wave of sexual harassment scandals on Capitol Hill. Al Franken, of course, uh, John Conyers, previously named Farenthold, and Representative Ruben Kiwen, a Democrat of Nevada, also hit with sexual misconduct allegations, have said they won't seek re-election next year. Welcome back to the Kicker in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio, our final segment of today's big uh, Boxing Day blowout, we'll call it. Then why not? That's a pretty good name for it. Uh, where to go next? There's uh, the one segment left for some major stories, and I can't decide which direction I'm going to go, but I'll, I'll, I'll make a decision on the fly. I think we'll use the half hour for one uh, long read story, which just, I guess we really have to catch up on. This is something we've hinted at for a long time on the show, uh, just from the stories we've read. It's been, well, really, of course, it's the reporters doing the footwork, hinting at this becoming a major part of the Trump slash Trump Russia slash Trump the rest of the world agenda. And I know it's uh, close to, always close to Armando's thoughts. This a Luke Harding piece for Newsweek uh, from the... Mm, near the end of last week, is Donald Trump's dark Russian secret hiding in Deutsche Bank's vaults? We've danced around the issue of Deutsche Bank and exactly what they've been doing. They just uh, were curiously the only bank in the world interested in lending money to Donald Trump at a certain point when every other bank in the world literally had given up on him uh, Deutsche Bank was uh, still a believer, and, and well, let's see what they have to say here. Uh, it sounded like an exhausted parent scolding a tantrum-prone toddler with a penchant for tossing toys from his stroller. In November 2008, Stephen Molo, an attorney for Deutsche Bank, wrote a letter to the Supreme Court of New York about one of the company's most troublesome clients. At issue was $640 million that client had borrowed in 2005 to fund construction of a new hotel in Chicago. The client had personally guaranteed the loan. But a few years later, the Great Recession devastated the economy and he defaulted on his payment with $330 million outstanding. Deutsche was seeking an immediate $40 million from the client, plus interest, legal fees, and costs. The debtor in question? Hmm, yes. uh, Donald Trump, the future president of the United States. Instead of paying up, the New York real estate mogul countersued, claiming the 2008 crash was a force majeure event, one that Deutsche had helped precipitate. Well, that's not a bad claim. Therefore, he argued he wasn't obliged to pay the money back. Instead, he claimed Deutsche owed him money, $3 billion in damages. Wow. In response, Molo drew up a withering document contrasting Trump's frivolous writ with his long career of boasting about how rich he was. Trump proclaims himself the archetypal businessman, a dealmaker without peer. Trump has stated in court he is worth billions of dollars. In addition to substantial cash, personal investments, and various other tangible assets, he maintains substantial interest in numerous extraordinary properties in New York and around the country. Those assets included hotel projects in seven U.S. cities, as well as in Mexico, the Dominican Republic, Canada, Panama, and Dubai, United Arab Emirates, the lawyer noted. There were also casinos and golf courses scattered all over the world. The same day Trump argued that the Great Recession meant he didn't need to pay back his debts, he gave an interview to the Scotsman newspaper. After a two-year fight, he had gotten approval from the Scottish government for a new resort near Balmody in Aberdeenshire. Hope we got any of those pronunciations right. And he was thrilled. The world has changed financially, and the banks are all in such trouble, he told the paper. But the good news is, that we are doing very well as a company. Might as well fall into the accent here. And we are in a very, very strong cash position. 
Trump said he didn't have any exposure to the stock market, had bought the Scottish land for cash, and was now well-placed to build the world's greatest golf course. Two weeks later, George Soriel, a Trump Organization executive, assured the Scotsman that the tycoon had a billion dollars earmarked for the course. If those statements weren't damning enough, Molo's affidavit cited the real estate tycoon's literary works, which summarized his insouciant attitude toward paying back other people's money. Trump, the attorney observed, provided extensive advice on how to do business in his half-dozen or so books in How to Get Rich, Trump advises leaders to use the courts to be strategically dramatic in Think Big and Kick Ass in Business and in Life. I didn't even realize he had a book called that. He boasts of how he, quote, loves to crush the other side and take the benefits. Trump's strategy, honed during his terrible financial struggles with lenders during the 1990s, was to turn it back on the banks. I figured it was the bank's problem, not mine. Molo quoted him as saying, in connection with unpaid debt. I mean, there's so much to unpack in that. But we won't do it. You know exactly what we'd unpack if we gave the time over to it. As a result of these maneuvers, by the mid-2000s, U.S. financial institutions had stopped lending to Trump for his building projects. Okay, good. Deutsche was the only one still willing to work with him. After Trump burned that last bank, Deutsche shunned him as well. But Trump soon found a creative way to get off its blacklist and return to solvency. Two years after Molo wrote his letter to court, Trump settled his feud with the German bank. How he did it was bizarre. He paid back Deutsche with a massive lifeline from Deutsche. Only this time, he eschewed its real estate team which wanted nothing to do with him, and got a loan from its private wealth division. This group typically deals with high net worth individuals, not real estate transactions. But in 2010, it not only lent him the money he owed its real estate team, but also reportedly gave Trump another $25 million to $50 million in credit. Deutsche employees in New York were surprised by the bank's decision, yeah, I bet, when asked whether it was normal to give more money to a customer who was a bad credit risk and liked to sue. One former senior staff member at the bank put it succinctly, are you effing kidding me? Well, I'm not, but you put the money out there. Are you effing kidding me? Over the next few years, the money kept rolling in for Trump. He took out two mortgages against a resort in Miami and a $170 million loan to finish his hotel in Washington, D.C. According to Bloomberg, by the time Trump was elected president of the United States in November of 2016, he owed Deutsche around $300 million, an unprecedented debt for an incoming president. His June financial disclosure showed he owes the bank $130 $130 million, which is due in full in 2024. The loans to Trump weren't the only abnormal behavior at Deutsche. Around the same time he received his new line of credit, the bank was laundering money, according to the New York State Department of Financial Services, Russian money, as a matter of fact, billions of dollars that flowed from Moscow to London and then from London to New York, part of a scheme for which European and American regulators eventually punished the bank, was the timing of this illicit operation and the loans to Trump coincidental or evidence of something more sinister, a critical chapter in the president's long history of suspicious business deals with Russian and post-Soviet oligarchs. In January, Trump claimed the former, tweeting in his usual bombastic style, I have nothing to do with Russia. No deals, no loans, no nothing. But the president's refusal to accept the assessment of his intelligence agencies that Moscow meddled in the 2016 election has, among other things, fueled suspicions about his ties to Russia. 
Robert Mueller is now trying to find out the truth about those suspicions. The special counsel is investigating Russian interference from the hacking of the Democratic National Committee to alleged coordination between the Trump campaign and Moscow. So far, his team has charged key Trump campaign officials Paul Manafort and Rick Gates with money laundering, as well as other offenses. He's also gotten two former advisors, Michael Flynn and George Papadopoulos, to plead guilty to lying to the FBI and cooperate with the probe. Now, however, Mueller appears to be following the money, trying to determine if Trump has a financial connection to Russia, one that might at least partly explain his behavior. In December, the German newspaper Handelsblatt reported that the special counsel's office had subpoenaed Deutsche Bank, demanding data and documents related to people or entities tied to the president and those close to him. The White House says the subpoena doesn't directly pertain to Trump or his family's accounts, but if the president has a dark Russian secret, the German banking giant's money laundering scandal may be key to finding out what it is. The story of how Deutsche became embroiled in the Trump-Russia probe dates back to 2005, when the German lender bought UFG, a boutique investment bank, to acquire an entry point into Moscow. UFG's co-founder and chairman was Charles Ryan, a charming American banker with libertarian views. Ryan's partner was Boris Fyodorov, a finance minister under former Russian President Boris Yeltsin. The bank straddled west and east and was international and local. The man behind Deutsche Bank's aggressive expansion was Anshu Jain, its future co-CEO. He persuaded Ryan to stay on and head up Deutsche's new Moscow office, and he came up with a controversial strategy to tap into potentially huge Russian profits, forge relationships with state partners. He wanted, in effect, to become friends with the Kremlin. One way of doing this was to hire people with connections. Among them, Russia's most powerful banker, Andrei Kostin, who had served as a Soviet diplomat in Sydney and London. Intelligence sources think he was a KGB spy. Like many others who spoke to me for this story, they did so anonymously because they weren't authorized to talk to the press. In the 1990s, he became head of Venetia Konum Bank. Remember that one? V-E-B. For short, a state development institution described by one former CIA analyst as the Kremlin's cookie jar. Then Vladimir Putin made Kostin head of Venetia Torg Bank, VTB another state-run bank, after which Kostin expanded it to operate in 19 countries. VTB worked in many countries with minimal oversight, which meant the Kremlin could use it for espionage. In 2005, VTB absorbed two banks traditionally used in Soviet times for spying and shifting currency to Western Communist parties. These were the Moscow Narodny Bank, based in London, and Eurobank in Paris. Meanwhile, Jane and Deutsche Bank recruited Kostin's 20-something son, Andre. In spring of 2007, the young Kostin moved from a posting in London to Deutsche Bank in Moscow. Suddenly, Kostin's son got massive flows of business, a high-level banking source told me, and it appeared his father may have helped. Deutsche did a series of lucrative trades with VTB. According to the source, the German bank's Moscow subsidiary began posting profits of $500 million to $1 billion a year, with VTB generating somewhere between 50 and 80 percent of all revenue. Other investment banks based in Moscow were chagrined and suspected that Deutsche owed its success to its alliance with Russian state interests. They were doing some very curious things, said Christopher Barter, the CEO of Goldman Sachs Moscow at the time. Nobody could make sense of their business. We found the nature and concentration of their business with VTB quite galling. Nobody else could touch VTB. Everyone in Moscow understood that VTB was more than a bank. It had ties to Russian intelligence. Putin's Federal Security Service, or FSB, spy chief Nikolai Petrushev and his successor, Alexander Bortnikov, both sent their sons to work at VTB. The bank's deputy chief executive, Vasily Titov, chaired the FSB's public council. VTB may also have had contacts with Trump associates, according to the New York Times. In November of 2015, a few months after Trump announced he was running for president, one of his business partners, Felix Sater, wrote an email to Trump lawyer Michael Cohen saying VTB had agreed to bankroll the Trump Tower Moscow project. We remember this one. Trump signed a letter of intent for the deal. When the project stalled, Cohen tried reaching out to Putin's spokesperson, Dmitry Peskov, to help jumpstart it but it ultimately failed. 
Costin, the VTB banker, says he doesn't know Sater and never had any role in the real estate deal. We never, ever heard about this case, he told the Times. It's absolutely wrong information, absolutely fake news. Of course, we remember that deal being the one that the Agalarovs had engineered as well, right? Hmm. And then they showed up in Trump Tower in June of last year, and uh, you know the rest. During those negotiations, Sater, the son of a Russian mafia boss, saw things differently. Our boy can become president of the USA and we can engineer it, he wrote to Cohen about the Trump Tower Moscow plans. I will get all of Putin's team to buy in on this. I will manage this process. Well before Sater went looking for a deal there, the Russian capital was awash with petrodollars and opportunity. At the start of the new millennium, Moscow was an alluring destination for Western expatriates, especially for young single males. There were the Devushki, long-legged Russian girls, some from Moscow, some newly arrived from the provinces, who were keen to meet foreigners and practice their English. There were the nightclubs, the parties, fueled by toasts and endless vodka shots, and the friendships, always more intense than those at home. But there was a dark side to this new Russia, as one of those attracted by its offer of riches discovered. Tim Wiswell grew up in Old Saybrook, Connecticut, about 100 miles northeast of New York City. He was more of a repatriate than an expat. His father had worked in oil and gas in Russia. When he was 17, Wiswell spent a year at the Anglo-American school in Moscow and then returned to the United States for college. In his mid-twenties, Wiswell went back to Moscow and got a job with Alpha, the private bank owned by the oligarch Mikhail Friedman. From there, he moved to Deutsche Bank. Wow, what a record. By age 29, he was head of Russian equities. He found a Russian girlfriend, Natalia Makosi, an art historian, whom he met at a Moscow dinner party and later married. In the wake of the 2007-2008 crash, profits from the bank's Russian business plummeted. Traders were now under pressure to increase revenue, but after Wiswell took over around 2009, business was suddenly improving, and Barter suspects that something nefarious was going on at Deutsche during that time period. After the crash, Barter says he was approached by broker types, not very senior, seeking to do large, unexplained volumes of trades with Goldman Sachs. These were on behalf of major Russian clients. The brokers declined to identify their counterparties. Their names were concealed beneath shell company after shell company. Wow, what do you know? Barter says, making a due diligence impossible. He turned this business down in five seconds. The same entities approached Wiswell and company and got better results. Between 2011 and February 2015, Wiswell presided over a money laundering scheme run from the equities desk of Deutsche Bank's Moscow office, according to a report from the DFS, and more than $10 billion was shifted from Russia to the West. The method was simple but effective. In Moscow, a Russian client bought blue-chip Russian stocks from Deutsche Bank Moscow in companies like Gazprom or Sberbank. The payments were in rubles. The size of a typical order was $2 million to $3 million. Shortly afterward, a non-Russian, quote, customer sold exactly the same number of securities to Deutsche Bank in London, paying in dollars. There was no economic logic to these mirror trades, the DFS report found. The buyers and sellers were ostensibly different, but in reality, one and the same. At least 12 entities used the scheme to surreptitiously convert rubles into dollars. The money was interred in offshore accounts. Those involved moved billions out of one Deutsche location in Moscow to another location in New York through offshore territories such as, you'll never guess, Cyprus and the British Virgin Islands. There were nearly 6,000 such transactions, and nobody in New York, London, Frankfurt, or any other international financial centers seemed to notice. When outsiders raised concerns, like a European bank, for example, Wiswell swatted them aside. The DFS report said he told the European bank not to worry. Wiswell approved the trades with anonymous Russian clients. He threatened and browbeat his colleagues on several occasions, a New York regulator said, according to the report, when it appeared they had not moved quickly enough to facilitate transactions. In Moscow, Wiswell's 20-person equities desk was made up of Russians and Americans. One of its duties was to keep clients happy. That might mean extravagant skiing trips and visits to elite nightclubs. One of Wiswell's business and skiing partners was Dmitry Perevalov, the owner of a Moscow fund called Lenturno. 
about seven years ago for his 40th birthday, Perevalov flew a group of people on a private jet to Mauritius. The jet belonged to the Russian Orthodox Church's most important bishop, of course, why not, Patriarch Kirill of Moscow. But Perevalov chartered it for the occasion. His guests stayed at the luxurious Four Seasons Hotel in Anahita on the east coast of the Indian Ocean Island. Some invitees scarcely knew their host, the former bartender. Those who were his friends, including Wiswell, called him Dima. One guest who met Wiswell at the party described him as charismatic and charming, a tall, handsome, all-American guy. This person also said Wiswell came across as a major lightweight in terms of banking and finance. He had nothing special going for him. I remember him speaking pretty poor Russian. We wondered whether he was doing kosher business. Perevolov flew in a popular performer to crown his birthday celebration, the Russian rapper Timati, who gave a concert. Under a starry sky, guests danced to Timati's hit, Welcome to San Tropez. Too much money in the bank account. Hands in the air make you scream and shout. Some brilliant lyrics there. Drinks, private villas, water skiing in the lagoon, everything was taken care of. I was wondering, uh, who the F is paying for all of this? The guest told me. It was crazy. But I stayed anyway. Lightweight or not, Wiswell was getting rich. While the mirror trades were happening, Wiswell's wife became the owner of two offshore companies. One in the British Virgin Islands, one in Cyprus. In 2015, a counterparty paid $250,000 into her account. This was for financial consulting. Similar payments, totaling $3.8 million, were made through two companies in Belize. These payments were undisclosed compensation, the DFS found. A bribe. Which bank cleared them? Deutsche Bank in New York. According to journalist Ed Caesar, there were further payments made to the Wiswells. The idea of the money was to hook you so you're not going to do unexpected things, one Moscow broker told Caesar in an article published in The New Yorker. These payments were always made in cash and always delivered in a bag. The end of this scheme came in August of 2015 when Deutsche Bank suspended Wiswell and then fired him. After that, he disappeared. There were Facebook postings from Southeast Asia and Bali where the Wiswells went with their two small children. He is now allegedly back in Moscow. His lawyer, Ekaterina Dukina, declined to comment on his case, but in his wrongful dismissal suit against Deutsche, Wiswell said he was merely the fall guy for the bank's wrongdoing. He also claimed that around 20 colleagues, including two senior managers in London, knew all about the trades. The scandal was a grievous blow to Deutsche Bank's reputation, and an expensive one. About ten days before Trump's inauguration, the DFS, which has the power to suspend any bank with a branch in New York, fined the bank $475 million. London's Financial Conduct Authority imposed a £163 million penalty, that's about $218 million. The Justice Department and the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York are still investigating the bank's role in the scandal. The bank carried out an internal review, which didn't identify the Russians behind the scheme. It's still unclear who they were or where the billions went or where the money came from in the first place. What is clear, however, from the DFS report and conversations with sources in Moscow is that a Kremlin bank, VTB, run by proxies of the FSB, had seemingly captured Deutsche Bank's Moscow outpost. The German banks, London and New York divisions were economic beneficiaries of this arrangement, and they facilitated the illegal flight of capital by some well-connected Kremlin insiders. While this was going on, Deutsche Bank in New York was lending hundreds of millions of dollars to the future American president, a man known to be litigious and a credit risk. My Guardian colleague Nick Hopkins and I wanted to find out if Trump's loans and the money laundering scandal were connected. But Deutsche Bank stonewalled us. Its policy was to say nothing about its clients, including the president. In late 2016, that question and others led Hopkins and me to a man now at the center of Mueller's inquiry, Christopher Steele. This was before the world knew he was behind the famous dossier, raw intelligence alleging, among other things, that Russian intelligence had for years been uh, had years of compromising information on Trump some of it sexual in nature. 
Hopkins knew Steele, but neither of us were aware that he was sitting on that dossier. We met on a Thursday afternoon, weeks before Christmas, when London streets were crowded with shoppers. Steele had agreed to chat over four o'clock tea. We tried a wine and cafe bar called Balls Brothers and found a tucked away table. I went to the bar and came back with drinks, beer for Steele, Coke for Nick, a pot of tea for me. Steele clearly likes being in the shadows, away from publicity or fuss. In the world of corporate intelligence, the fewer people who know what you're doing, the better. Have you heard of me? He asked. I confessed I hadn't. I knew most of the people in London who were focused on Russia, but not Steele. Good, he said. That's how I like it. For the next 45 minutes or so, we asked Steele about Trump's connections to Moscow. He offered helpful hints about following the money, but little more. In addition to questions about Deutsche Bank, we inquired about another Russian money laundering operation, one that involved Putin's cousin, Igor. Really? Yeah, okay. Between 2010 and 2014, Moscow bankers were sending cash out of the country through something called the Global Laundromat, a scheme that cleaned at least $20 billion, according to investigators in Moldova and the Balkans, through the true figure, though the true figure may be much higher. This is how it worked. Shell companies in the United Kingdom lent money to one another, at least on paper. Russian businesses underwrote these loans. Company A would default on paying back Company B. Typically, a Moldovan citizen was involved. The companies would obtain a court judgment in Moldova asking the Russian firms to settle their debt. And voila! The Russian businesses would legally transfer hundreds of millions of dollars to a bank in Moldova's capital, Chisinau. From Chisinau, the money went to a bank in Latvia, Trusta Commerzbanka. From there, the cash went everywhere to 92 countries, much of it vanishing offshore. Well, as you might suspect, this is quite the saga, and it goes on and on. And before all of this is finished, Jared Kushner makes an appearance in this, Carter Page makes an appearance in all of this. Um, just about every name we've ever added to the list of names to watch make appearances in all this. It gets very technical, and this section continues to describe this particular scheme. I, I kind of want to skip around a little bit here and uh, give a little bit more of the background, but uh, there's no way to capture the whole thing. We'll have to return to this, and we'll be discussing it further, no doubt about it. I don't know whether I can promise that we'll get right back to it, on Wednesday or even uh, some point this week. But it is an extensive look at how Deutsche Bank seems to connect so many of the figures in the Trump-Russia story, the uh, the story of Eric Trump boasting about how all of the golf courses were financed with Russian money and that they don't rely on American banks is in here, uh, as is, of course, Eric's later Denial that he ever made such a statement, which that really worked out really well. And uh, just uh, unbelievable how many parts of the the uh, Trump-Russia story this thing really touches, which is what made it so important to at least enter onto the record, even if I couldn't get oh just a little bit more than halfway through this before we had to give this up. I knew I would never be able to cram all of this in here, but if I don't get this out here now for discussion then uh, we're going to be way behind on uh, the curve here, and uh, we're going to be really sorry. I think this is probably the next big break in uh, the connection of all the weird and disparate points. Oh, yes, here are the Agalarovs. Uh, I knew they had to make an appearance in there. They couldn't have been left out of that. Uh, and just, I mean, an amazing, amazing, wide-ranging, never-ending story. But thank you for hanging in there with me for today's big Boxing Day blowout. Uh, this, was a, this was a tough one to put together, I must say, but I was glad to get this one out there and on the record so that uh, we'd have plenty to discuss. I was glad to be able to get back to that uh, weirdo Chilean mining guy who's renting the house to Jared and Ivanka. Just I had a feeling that one was going to come back to haunt us. and uh, Well, not us. Them, more specifically. I uh, hope it never comes back to haunt me. I, uh, I've i really had enough of these guys. Anyway, uh, amazing things developing here, and I do hope we can get back to it in the near future. 
Thanks again for hanging in there with me, and do stay tuned for the rest of the Netroots Radio Programming Day. Of course, I can't do the proper handoff to Justice for his fantastic show following up on all the things I doubtless missed in not doing a live show today. But as you know, you can always depend on, on him for an eclectic and interesting mix of the leading headlines, the hottest stories, and something out of left field that you never would have expected otherwise. Thank God he's there to follow up for us and keep our interest in all of this stuff rolling. We're ready to sign off for the rest of the day and uh, hand it off, and we'll see you again on Wednesday when we bring back Joan McCarter and Greg Dworkin to join us and a little bit less of that echo. Hopefully next time we're back on the air. From Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the k in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Once again, thanks for hanging in there. Even with that sort of technical glitch about that echo, I figured out that there was a button pressed since the last break I took to try and get this thing squeezed out before the dawn of Boxing Day. i got to get this out to the West Coast and deliver it to justice so he can air it to you. I'll be back to talk to you live on Wednesday.